Welcome back to the Trauma Therapist Podcast. My name is Guy McPherson. My mission is to help trauma therapists be their incredible selves, to be human, to be real, not just a clinician. I'm a big believer in who we are is more important than what we know. And this requires cultivating authenticity, genuineness, and vulnerability, and that requires intention. You can learn more about my courses and workshops by going to the traumatherapistproject.com. That's the traumatherapistproject.com. Let's get started. So five, four, three, two, and one. All right, folks, welcome back to the podcast. Very excited to have his mic is today, David Archer. David, welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. So David is an EMDR IA approved EMDR consultant and course provider. He maintains a full-time private practice and he's often recruited to provide consulting services to other therapists and organizations throughout North America. He is a master of social work graduate from McGill University, where he is also subsequently graduated from the couple and family therapy program. His expertise has been influenced by the principles of mindfulness, intersectional feminism, and critical race theory. He's one of the few mental health professionals in Canada who can provide EMDR, brain spotting, EFT, and other mind-body strategies. Additional areas of clinical interest include working with individuals who've suffered from PTSD, racial trauma, minority stress, addictions, relational conflict, and eating disorders. David, welcome. Thank you, Guy. All right. So before we get going here, uh, share with our listeners where you're from originally and where you are currently. Yeah. So um, um, so I wanted to thank you again for that introduction, just knowing that those are some of the things that I do. I'm also the uh, developer of uh, what's called, uh, it's an integrative clinical framework that's called Rhythm and Processing. And the intention the motivation behind it is to eliminate the mental health consequences of racial trauma so how did i get there well it's because i was uh, born in this area called montreal canada and uh although like some people when you say that you're from canada they're like well, you're the one who wrote anti-racist psychotherapy it's like, <laughs> yes this book <laughs> um unfortunately um the issues of oppression uh the issues of racism uh prejudice these are things that are um, I guess we could say that they're international exports. So these are things that are uh, in many places around the world. And because I came from this area and I was raised around a time when there was, um, like Quebec has an interesting history, the rest of the provinces. Quebec was trying to separate from the rest of Canada. There was also the Oka crisis where there were people who were trying to take away land from indigenous people. So it was impossible for me to have a neutral basis to start with. And so I had to understand from a young age what it meant to be a black person, what it meant to be a descendant of Jamaicans, what it meant to be located in what we call Montreal, but the real name is called Jochjage, which is the name that the Haudenosaunee people gave it. Mm -hmm. So it's really that there was no other choice but to create this type of uh, approach the way the the reason why i'm this way is because i was born into this context mm -hmm. at what point david did you uh say to yourself i want to begin to study this well so i used to be a software engineer and um even before that i was an artist and as an artist uh, I would just draw by myself, these little comics and all these things. As a software engineer, I was working to help some one person get rich. And I was like, okay, well, is this what my work is supposed to be? And so uh, I remember when I was a software engineer, there were these self-help, uh, self-hypnosis uh, audios that I was listening to, these uh, these like downloadable audio tape things uh, to get over my shyness. And so I remember programming and, and being like, wow, this is pretty cool that someone could say words and I repeat these words and I feel a bit better about myself. Mm. And I started to think about it and to uh, share it with everyone that I knew. And the idea came up to get into psychology. So I went from computer science to psychology and there was a bit of a learning curve, but it was interesting that in psychology, 
we were also trying to use data in order to uh, find ways of being able to solve issues. So there was some, I guess, generalizability from the two. And eventually, after doing my bachelor's in psychology, I did a master's in social work, did a master's in marriage and family therapy. And from there, working in indigenous communities where there were substance abuse, where there was the effects of colonization, I wanted to see if it were would be possible to use that artistic background, that knowledge of information systems in order to help people to overcome their suffering. So that's what led me into EMDR therapy, which uh, as I'm sure that you and some of your viewers might know, there's a, uh, a lot of a focus on adaptive information processing. And so, yeah, all the skills just came into one. Mm-hmm. And through that creativity spawned uh, the person that you see in front of you. When you started, when you were first inspired to get into psychology, were you driven, whether subconsciously or not, Mm. uh, by the topic of racial trauma? Yeah, well, the interesting thing is that if if it were unconscious, it'd be hard for me to know. And maybe on some subconscious level, it was the intention. But when I studied in psychology, there was not a lot of talk about race. Uh, Many times, the only time in psychology that there'd be a mention about race, I remember in my perception, my sensation and perception class, we were studying about like the the human retina and they were talking about, well, normally people can see this, but on a side note, remember that black people have worse vision than white people. I was like, what is this? Where is this coming from? And I noticed that many times, even if, if it would be something like biology, there would just be this this tangent that would be taken that they're talking about the so-called hard sciences. And then they would use black people as this reference of saying that, by the way, white people are still better than black people. So (laughs) it's really that um, I was just, again, I was just like trying to live my life. And the idea of race and racism is something that was projected onto me. So Mm -hmm. when I was studying in psychology, I realized there was not a lot of a focus on race. Something felt as if it was missing. When I studied in social work, that's when they were explicit about talking about oppression. And then when I did uh, marriage and family therapy, that's when I started to think even deeper about the ideas of systems. Because when you're meeting with a client, it looks as if you're meeting with an individual. Mm -hmm. But most times we are meeting with a person that is a consequence or maybe a survivor of different experiences and different events that have transpired, maybe due to their family history, but especially due to the socialization of being a man, being a woman, being a person in this specific context. So I feel that family therapy helped me to just remember that we are never meeting a person in isolation that everyone is always in relationship either to their partners, either to their employment, but especially to their society that they find themselves in. This, I mean, obviously, this is such a huge topic when, when racial trauma. I mean, where do you begin talking about that? But oh, what yes. Is, what is your oh, – I mean, if, if we can get specific and just try to narrow this down to a certain degree, what is your – hope in the work you do? Um, I think it's to remind people that there's no such thing as a broken person. I think that's, that's key. There's many times when a person will come to me and they will talk about trauma. And in some way, I feel that our society does this is it makes it so that the person who sees themselves as traumatized is uh, it's like they're alone to blame for it. So they have no choice but to internalize and say, I'm broken or I'm not deserving of love or I'm bad because of this characteristic of myself, et cetera, et cetera. I think that there's something about our society that makes it so certain types of people will be, will have a higher risk of becoming traumatized or will experience certain types of, uh, or, or will have certain types of patho- pathogenic associations that will happen in your mind. So 
a lot of what my work is, is to help a person to undo the violence that has taken place due to their family of origin and due to their interpersonal interactions, and also due to the social construction uh, of suffering that takes place. And when they are able to get rid of some of those negative beliefs that they have internalized, they can then get into a openness that they can start to internalize positive beliefs of their own choosing. So instead of the negative belief that says, I am, uh, I am defective, or I'm not a good person, the person is able to discard those beliefs, recognize that they came out from outside of themselves, and then start to install a belief that says, I am worthwhile, uh, I'm deserving of love. And I believe that when we can do this well, when we learn to work with the spectrum of, uh, of uh, well, structural dissociation and the spectrum of PTSD, complex PTSD, and those who suffer from dissociative identity disorder, when we can do it well, uh, miracles become more commonplace than just being the exception. So being a trauma therapist is very challenging, but depending on how we look at our work, we can protect ourselves from, from vicarious trauma and we can get more in touch with experiences of vicarious growth. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is still to answer one of your first questions is how did I get here? Mm -hmm. And I really credit this to um, being in a family where people cared about me and also being able to see clients move from being broken or move from that internalization of thinking that they were broken to then believing that they're worthwhile. Um, when we're trying to learn how to help people, there's nothing like, because of course I worked in software engineering. So when you try to compile a program, there would be an error and it'd be very clear, okay, this program's not going to work. When we are working with clients, when we're working with the human system, it's sometimes it's pretty clear of like, okay, that intervention is still leaving this person in tears. I got to think, what can I do better in this situation? The client always is giving us feedback. And so the way how I developed this way of looking at this type of work is by seeing what didn't work, what did work, and also what would make it so that people can see themselves as more whole. <laughs> Can you give me an example, give us a specific example of what, and we're we talking about rhythm and processing here? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Give us an example of, of what that looks like. How do you work with someone? Sure. So just to know that um, rhythm and processing is an integrative clinical framework. So it's, it's more than just one specific technique, but there's a set of strategies that, um, that inform the way how we would work with certain types of individuals. So uh, from the get-go, it is recommended because we're trauma therapists in the audience, it's recommended that we're going to do a thorough assessment. And so we want to make sure, especially to screen for dissociation. I'm a big fan of the MID-60 by Dr. Mary Kate. I wish that I remembered her last name, but uh, she's an amazing clinician or a researcher that's from Australia, I believe. And the MID-60 is very helpful to help us to be able to do 60 questions that'll help a client to be able to see uh, the type and the category of how uh, the trauma is affecting them. So we'll get some uh, idea about what persecutory intrusions are. We'll get some idea about what dissociative amnesia, what's going on with all of that. And that helps me to be able to then with the client describe to them what we are we are scoring all of this because you're now in the therapy that's going to help to treat these types of things so of course i'll do it uh, anxiety scales depression scales all of that it's a full comprehensive psychotherapy David, After excuse the, me, but is this specifically for racial trauma to, to to target racial trauma or not yes yes it is okay let me back up a bit it's important for us to understand exactly what race is. So race is not a scientific concept. Race is really that you see a person and then you think that this is what they are. Um, race is something that is socially constructed. This means that depending on your skin tone, if you go to a different country, you're not black. Or if you go to a different country, you're not white. Or if you're from South America, then you go to the States. 
um, they will say that you're white or they will say that you're uh, Latina or Latino. So depending on where you're at, you will see yourself as different and the society will see you as different. Gender is a similar thing that it is socially constructed. So it's not a hundred percent a binary of saying that a person is male or female because that's not determined by the chromosomes, for example, because a person can have X, Y chromosomes and they can look very different. They can look similar to someone who has X, X chromosomes. So we know then that gender itself is something that is created. The idea of manness, of womanness, these are things that are created. They're not a hundred percent. It's like, um, depending on where you go, they change. The interesting thing about race, the reason why I focus on race is because um, I feel that it's something that we see and it can have like um, devastating consequences, even though it's completely fake. So it's not something that's real. But when, because I focus on racial trauma, I'm also focused on the impact that the society has on the individual because of the society's gaze. So this is the reason why, since I'm in a metropolitan city, I work with people of all quote unquote races. I work with people across the gender spectrum. So cis male, uh, non-binary, et cetera, LGBTQ. And we are still able to get the same benefit for the client because race relates to how the society sees you how you internalize the terrible things that have happened to you because of your identity. And that is something that happens with um, gendered violence, for example. This is something that happens with homophobia, for example. Mm -hmm. So although the focus was initially on race, it ended up being able to be an intervention that generalizes to other oppressed people because the society uh, that uses white supremacy or the society that uses the insecurity of whiteness also is using uh, hetero patriarchy as well in a same in a similar intersecting way. Mm-hmm. Is that clear? So yes. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, I know that yeah. this is a different perspective because a lot of times people will think of race in in this one way, and then people will think, well, because I'm the I wrote anti racist psychotherapy, so people will think, well, this is the thing that is to help black people then. But we have to understand is that um, uh, the the way where racism comes from, of course, it is that the victim of it might be a person who is racialized in the specific way. But white people also have a race. So that's why we can still use some of these approaches with white people. It's just that white people most times, many of them have forgotten that they come from Africa. So there's this idea that we are so different from each other that this therapy is only going to apply to those who have the explicit um, uh, label of, of being racialized. But it's important to know that in a way, we all technically do have genders. We all technically, or at least the categorization by the society as having genders, we all technically have the categorizations categorization of race as well. Uh, So that is why we can use an intervention that is anti-racist and we can help a black person in the same way that we can use this intervention and help an Asian, a white person, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I've tested this. As I said, I work with people from all all over the different uh, spectrum of of race and uh, there's immigrants, there's people who are not native speakers of the language in this province. And they also experience different forms and varying forms of oppression. And uh, it seems to get the job done. Mm -hmm. But it's really to say that we will still uh, use what is recommended for trauma therapies with people who who may have been impacted by racial trauma, because a lot of people, regardless of whether it's depression, whether it's anxiety, I think for us to be effective, we have to consider uh, uh, etiology. We have to consider what is the first thing that caused this person to believe that they were depressed? What is the first event that transpired that led the person to have an eating disorder in the first place? And even though the eating disorder may not necessarily be related to the color of the person's skin, 
a lot of times there's a gendered element that's there. A lot of times there's a social element that's there. And when we can target the original um, anorexogenic statement or anorexogenic event that took place, when we are able to also build in certain resources to make the person be able to deal with certain urges, when we are able to address the traumas that have taken place that led them to identify as being anorexic or identify as being defective or problematic or any any of the the labels, we are able to get a resolution uh, uh, at a deep, deep level. So the work that I do of course, um, is not just limited to rhythm and processing. You can still do this with EMDR. You can still do this with brain spotting and all of these different approaches because the core of what makes the change happen is memory reconsolidation. Mm -hmm. So memory reconsolidation is going to mean that doesn't matter where the person came from. doesn't matter how the society looks at them. There was a natural process that helps all people to heal and recover rapidly and efficiently and permanently as well. Um, When we think of how people become traumatized, many times it's a one pass event. Like you can witness, um, for example, in the United States, we know that there are a lot of mass shootings that take place or, and um, like sometimes a person can experience that terrible event or survive that terrible event. And then after in July, there can be fireworks that are going off and they will feel that maybe that's the sound of a shot and they will react in a similar type of way with a hypervigilance, with an avoidance of loud sounds, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So from a single event, they were able to have this problem that would persist and stay with them over time. So we are able to use the principles of memory reconsolidation uh, strategically and with uh, virtual therapies so that maybe not a single pass, but in a sh- in within that clinical hour, we can help to reprocess trauma quickly, efficiently, and without the um, uh, the the big ab reactions that uh, that often take place with other trauma therapies. So we are able to present uh, disconfirming knowledge and disconfirming evidence for the client that is accessing something that took place in the past by being able to contrast with something that makes them feel completely awesome in the present and the brain updates the information. It files the trauma away in the past in, um, in, uh, yeah, it files it away in the past so that it's no longer present. And it does this in a way that makes a person smile instead of, um, like, uh, being fearful of, uh, the previous stimulus. In in your explanation of the work you do, I, I think I got a little confused. I mean, it, it almost sounded like you were saying, and I don't think you're saying this, but it almost sounded like you were saying that all, all trauma is racial trauma. No, it's that um, it's that uh, all trauma, I believe, actually comes from the society and the people and the interpersonal. It's like it's what's around the individual. It's just that racial trauma is going to be directed towards a specific uh, categorization of people. It's like gender trauma. It's like gender trauma has like falls under that umbrella of saying socially constructed forms of distress. And then after there's uh, categories that are below that. So racial trauma is one of those. Racial trauma just isn't white people oppressing black people? Um, No, because uh, white people have racial trauma. Right. Because most, if you've you've read uh, Resma Menachem, you'll know that uh, many white people that came to this country, uh, to our countries, they didn't come by choice. Some of them didn't really want to, if we go back far enough, is that the conditions that were in Europe at the time, like if I speak for my my Irish brothers and sisters that are out there, it wasn't always that comfortable in that continent. We know that there was also in Europe, there was a lot, of, it, it wasn't that nice all the time. So it's really to say that there's white people that have had to flee. So it was almost like a survival reaction that either intentionally they wanted to come to North America uh, purposefully, 
or they had no choice. When we think about some of the women who came to Quebec, that they were just there to kind of increase the population of the uh, of the settlers that were there. So there's a fight flight dynamic that existed within mm-hmm. white people from the beginning. There's a survival, a fear of survive, a fear of being oppressed or uh, this violence that took place towards them that is within the white body that then gets projected outwards. When we think about race and we think about the stereotypes that are uh, thrown onto black people, then I have to refer to the binary complex trauma cycle, which I explain in anti-racist psychotherapy. On one end, you will get uh, white supremacy slash white insecurity. What it means is that everything that we think of in terms of being white is oftentimes the best thing. So if you are a therapist, the best therapist is most likely a white person. If we, if you are like um, an intellectual, you, you're probably going to be like seen as a privileged individual, et cetera, et cetera. On the other end of the spectrum is black suffering. And so what happens with blackness is that we receive the, the traits and the characteristics that are rejected from the white body. In order for white supremacy to exist, it needs to discard all of the trauma and all of the negative aspects of itself. So the person who is not intelligent is a black person, or at least a dark skinned individual. The person who is lazy or who is hypersexualized is oftentimes going to be a person who is othered in the society. And in a way, it's that white supremacy and whiteness dissociates from its own trauma projects it into blackness when black people through the society internalize it or when the society itself validates it then that leads to uh validating the cycle of saying then that white people are good so on one on one end you will find that white insecurity projects its undesired traits into blackness blackness internalizes it and it validates the cycle so in this case the racist the person who hates other people does not need to feel better about himself what he can do is just harm the other person so the other person believes that they are lesser than and it is this cycle that allows the bullies to continue to do the things that they do and the the culture supports that too Right. It's, yes. It's, that's a major driving factor. It's not. It's. It's. I mean, when, as you're explaining, the 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 white person or people discard their trauma and project that onto the other. There's a full force, of cultural support, that right. I mean, that's where almost like the oppression is coming from or it moving toward. To. Yeah. Yes, it needs to. And remember also that because race itself is a construct, we can replace the binary complex trauma cycle titles with male dominance versus female sub- uh, submission. So it's a similar thing is that we will say that women are too emotional and then we will have certain people who were presidents of, of a country who will not be named who have very little, they get really upset and really triggered if you if you say things about them so it's it's just interesting how the traits that people don't like they project onto other individuals um, without needing to work on themselves and when the society permits this without giving certain without giving like a harsh consequence it then validates the process Mm -hmm. so what we are trying to do is it doesn't matter if it doesn't although race again is important I just want to say that it's not the only thing that is going to impact whether um, uh, a person can heal from trauma. I just want to make sure that that's that that's clear because it's it's not that it's not that all the trauma comes from the, the way how the person uh, how the society sees them, but uh, the way how the society sees them does uh, does have consequences. Mm-hmm. Whether it's whether it looks as if it's real or not. Um, like whether it looks like it's real from the outside, it seems to be real. I'm going to be talking about this actually at the uh, the ISSSTD. I'm going to be doing a plenary talk on using racial uh, uh, rhythm and processing. So I'll be explaining it uh, if anyone is listening. And uh, it's going to be, I think, the third week of April. 
and the talk is going to be about rhythm and processing. The study that I'm going to be talking about, the case study, relates to some uh, some measure. The measures that I used were the mid sixty CESD, GAD seven, and the PCL five. And I wanted to demonstrate that we are able to use this type of approach even with a white woman, and we are still able um, to get some dramatic changes mm. in in uh in the person's expression of uh, of their trauma so this was a client who was referred to me by a therapist the therapist saw that after about 15 sessions that there was so much of a change uh, that they were impressed they called me up and they asked if they could be my client so that's why i kind of feel like I got to share this with people. I need, I need, not only is it that clients need to know that they can recover, but therapists need to know that there's a way that we can do this that doesn't need to be so toxic to our own system. Mm -hmm. I've seen, since I started, I've seen people who have, who have burned out and no longer are therapists or needed to change careers. Um, I've seen uh, some approaches to therapy that look as if it is a little toxic, not only to the therapist, but also to the client. So I wanted to try to develop something that was actually client centered and a bit more humane. And I think that, uh, I think we deserve this. I think that, I think, um, we need to find ways that we can help people and also that the therapist as well can continue to do the work and that, uh, that clients can feel a bit more awesome for no reason. Let me just remind it. everyone that I'm speaking with David Archer. He is a uh, therapist, consultant. He has a private practice and author of several books, um, Anti-Racist Psychotherapy, Black Meditation, and Racial Trauma Recovery. And is there another one coming out? Yeah. So um, there's another book that I'm writing because the thing is, I'm a, I'm a father of a newborn. And oh, congratulations. I realized that. Thank you. It'll be some time before my son can read anti-racist psychotherapy as it's, this book is taught in some universities that are using this book. So I was like, wait, um, he, he can't count yet. He does, I don't even think he knows his name yet. Um, and he's still approaching that level of ego development. So I was thinking, I want to make it so that more people can come into this field. Uh, I want to make it also that because I'm the only black male EMDR approved consultant that I know in my country, I want to make it so that more people can be interested in the concepts of trauma reprocessing. So my next book is called Black Mountain Fight for the Future, and it's a mix between a Japanese anime fighting uh, comic book and also anti-racist psychotherapy principles in the future <laughs> and in a different galaxy. And the general concept is that uh, by being able to practice meditation, by being able to practice certain rituals that are indigenous to their planet, they're able to fight off this interplanetary corporation that that uh, practices what is called light supremacy. And uh, yeah, it's a lot of fun. I think that as therapists, we need to tap into that that creativity that comes with our work. I think that many of us, regardless of our approach, we see transformative things. We see things that, um, well, in, in some cases, in some contexts, we can see some things that challenge our uh, ideas of reality. And so I just want to keep writing to inspire that type of change. And so some of my books will be highly academic and nonfiction, and some of them will talk about people shooting lasers out of their hands, because I think, <laughs> why not? Right. Why not make it so that um, that not so that our idea of a therapist changes, so that our approaches to therapy can change as well? Let me ask you: We we kind of skipped over this. Uh, what is anti-racist psychotherapy? So uh, I like to answer this by saying: uh, Let me start first with what a racist psychotherapy is. I think it's super important for us to know yeah. this. A racist psychotherapy is one that is going to uh, victim blame effectively. A racist psychotherapy is one that maintains that there is this hierarchy between the therapist and the client of saying that the client is coming to see the therapist because the client themselves is helpless and they need to, they need a savior of some kind. So this is something that I believe that uh, I don't think it's helpful. I also think that 
it's something that makes it so that there is a taboo about going to therapy in my community and in many other communities as well, is when we think about psychotherapy itself, I just don't know many other black psychotherapists. I just, I haven't studied, uh, like in, when I was learning about this, I never saw anyone who looked like me. They didn't really show the picture of people, but we just assumed that everyone was an old white man that looked like Freud. We just assumed that they'd all have this big beard and maybe a pipe or something. So anti-racist psychotherapy is about recognizing that, um, not only is it that we are resolving the issue that exists in the person's trauma history, but that the therapist themselves also needs to heal. As the therapist is able to heal from their own internalized oppression, as the therapist is able to understand where they themselves are located um, in terms of their social location, in terms of uh, their own strengths, their own weaknesses, as the therapist is able to understand that the healing does not need to come from just the therapist. It doesn't need to come from just what's in our head, but it needs to come from in our heart. Then we are able to use approaches that are informed by memory reconsolidation to create change that puts the client at the forefront rather than the therapist. So even though I am using EMDR therapy, my EMDR therapy looks different because it's informed by principles that are just different. So you don't need to only use EMDR in order to use uh, to, uh, to say that you're an anti-racist psychotherapist. I didn't trademark it. Anyone mm -hmm. could call themselves that. But it's just to know that there's a different way of being able to do our work that empowers the client. There's mm -hmm. a way that we do this work that allows for the client to talk about race in the client in the therapy session. I've had a lot of uh, clients that would come and speak to me. Uh, they met other therapists and they came to speak to me because they said that their therapist was racist towards them. So how often does that happen and how who is documenting this? Uh, because the client cannot admit that type of thing to like, like who are they going to, they can't like admit it to the media or something. Who are they? They're going to call mm -hmm. the police on they can't do this. Um, but I've had enough clients come to me and say that these types of things happen to me in their therapy that I decided I needed to make. Um, not only did I need to make it so that I myself was not going to re-traumatize my client, but I needed to make it so that there was a philosophy that other people could learn so that regardless of the race of the therapist, that they could do more effective work and help our clients to just, uh, uh, to fully recover and be their full selves in the, out in the world. So in, in your description of um, racist therapy, it, there, there was no mention of skin tone, right? I mean, the, the qualities of the elements that you used to describe it were regardless of skin tone. I mean, someone kind of feeling like, you know, they were better than or knew more, more than, or that their, the client is coming to the therapist and the therapist is going, is going to help and fix, right? That has nothing to do with, with skin tone. Right. Because race is just about categorization. Okay. Race is about saying that there is a person who is privileged because their nose is straight or right. because their hair is not curly. Like race is just, it's arbitrary. So when we are saying something is racist, it's usually that there's a system that encourages this arbitrary way of categorizing people and gives people harsh consequences because of this non-scientific uh, categorization that we've established. So it's power is inherent within that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely. Guy, I'd recommend that you read the book. I think yeah. you're, you're going to find, you're going to find that when you read it, it, it's it's a little different than what people think that it is because your questions, the reason why you're asking them, I think makes a lot of sense. And I think we need to change the way how we look at what race and racism is because there's a lot of white people that feel as if they're, uh, it, it, it's like there's white people that feel as if they're blamed for something that they shouldn't have blame for. And so then there's a defensiveness that comes up when you say anti-racist, I'm like, what? Why are, why are you talking about race? But it's in part because it's like we shouldn't talk about race because if we talk about the fact that there are these hierarchies, then we might want to change them. 
So that's why I think that for many white people, there's a hesitancy of talking about race or racism because they feel that they will be blamed. And also the society benefits from us not talking about race. Otherwise we will realize, wait, um, this thing does not benefit um, the, the majority of individuals. Also, uh, sorry, one other thing I just want to add is that race is inextricably linked with capitalism as well. Yeah. So we have to understand that when I'm going to use Andrea Smith's definition of what white supremacy is, is that she's going to speak about um, uh, anti-blackness that's linked up with capitalism. So the idea of saying that a person is worth this amount or this amount because of their appearance of their body. Then there is also a uh, genocide, which relates to the idea of indigeneity and or how the indigenous people must be removed from these countries so that the rightful people who call themselves Americans or Canadians can take all of the land. And then after there's Orientalism, that's also linked with it as well. And Orientalism is the idea that your country and my country is almost always at war all the time because there's always a foreign aggressor. So when I'm talking about race in this way, I'm talking about it beyond the physical appearance of the individual. It's important for us to zoom out a little and see what is the function of race. And many times the function is not only just to um, to put down other people, but it's often to get a material benefit. Mm. And that material benefit could be money, but it could also be esteem. It could be imaginary things mm. as well. But it's to zoom out and think about race on a global scale. And that's yeah, there's so much there's so much I can add to it, but I just generally want to say that because our societies and our countries themselves are traumatized, just like if you look at a family system, if the parents themselves are traumatized, they can push they can put this onto the identified patient. They can put it onto the child themselves. So the child believes that they're acting of their own volition, but they have inherited some a story that's not even theirs. So we help the client to get better ultimately because that improves their relationships. Mm -hmm. As we improve those relationships, we improve our communities. And it's it's a hypothesized that if we can make it that we're not traumatizing ourselves in our interactions with one another, then we can maybe even change the world. Well, I'm I'm glad you agreed to come on here. I mean I, I wanted to bring you on here because obviously this is um uh eye-opening i think definitely for Thank myself you. and for a lot of people too and i think um uh the, the more people are able to uh, you know become aware of what you're talking about i think it can only be beneficial for for everybody i appreciate it it took me a long time to write all these books so i'm glad that that uh that it has this positive effect but also is that um uh, a key thing i want to say as well is um that it's not enough to just write or to even read the books is that there needs to be action as well. Right. Is that uh, I'm an experiential therapist. It means that in my session, I want things to happen so that the client is going to take that experience and go out into the world and do things. So I think that it's not only that we need to read these type, this type of literature to go outside of our zone of comfort and learn about these things, but we need to just make it so that we can be more compassionate to the next person as well. We need yeah. to in a way, pay it forward by uh by helping other people to also have an easier time than we did i agree i mean I, and i think you know especially with regards to the um world of uh psychology uh this is a great first step or even second yeah. step i'm gonna yeah. have linked up um uh obviously your website what's the best way for people to get in contact with you david yeah so um Archertherapy.com is my website. Uh, if you want the books and if you don't mind supporting uh, billionaires who fly uh, rocket ships to the moon, then you can go on Amazon, uh, amazon.com and just uh, search anti-racist psychotherapy, uh, black meditation. Uh, if I can just quickly say anti-racist psychotherapy is just a general introductions for people to understand what this all is, the philosophy. Black meditation is a list of different resources for your black clients that may need something to help to supplement their therapy. Uh, 
Hmm. And then racial trauma recovery is an explanation of what I do in my sessions so that you can replicate those changes in yours. Awesome. Awesome. I'll have those linked up at the show notes page at the trauma tapers podcast.com. David, obviously, I mean, it, it, it felt to me and I'm sure to you even more so that we just scratched the surface here. Got it. And I, but I'd love to have you back. Thank you. Um, and I'd love to link up your talk at the, uh, was it ISSTD? When that's yes, out? that's, yep. that's going to be in, uh, uh, it's called, uh, we're going to be shifting the societal denial of dissociation. And so Jennifer Fried is also going to be there. Who's someone I really respect. There's also another plenary speaker. I wish that I had the advertisement in front of me so I could say their name, but I'm going to be there on the third day just to give a, a plenary talk about um, rhythm and processing and being able to just shift this denial of dissociation and shift this denial of of, uh, of racial trauma as it exists in our society. And uh, it'll be fun. Uh, you'll learn a lot and I'll probably show one or two of my techniques because we gotta be experiential. We gotta feel it. Uh, yeah, to yeah. I appreciate it. All right, sir, awesome meeting you and uh, we'll see you again. Thank you so much. Many All blessings right. to you and to everyone else. You.